<clears throat> All right, so hello group. I'm pretending I'm starting over from the very beginning. Uh, we're going to talk about frequency distributions tonight. Uh, this basically is section 2.1. <clears throat> so I'm going to offer up some vocabulary. Uh, I've got an example prepared and we'll go through the vocabulary with the example. <clears throat> and um, then we'll go ahead and uh, see where we stand after that. So frequency distribution. So what we need to do is we need to be able to organize lots of data, just the whole buttload of data really at the end of the day. Um, we start out really, really simple uh, with literally, and let me put a, a fluffy little cloud of green happiness around the word frequency. <clears throat> because when it comes to organizing data, one of the most basic things we can do is we can, we can basically count stuff. The problem with counting stuff, that works really well, but the problem with counting stuff is that we need <clears throat> something like classes or categories. <clears throat> We're gonna start with uh, numeric data because that's the most straightforward application of a frequency distribution, but it also works for uh, qualitative data too. Anytime you're counting up categories and seeing how many people, objects, or items fall within specific categories, you're messing around with a frequency distribution. So <clears throat> categories, something where they share a characteristic. And for us, this characteristic will be, in general, some sort of <clears throat> some sort of range of values. So that's what your frequency distribution looks like. And your generic frequency distribution will take on <clears throat> a structure such as this. Most of these are going to be uh, uh, tables with two columns. <clears throat> you have your class columns on the left, and you have your frequency or counts on the right. <clears throat> so your classes are listed out here with some sort of description, and then you have counts out here. If you've taken a look at the material in chapter two, you've already seen a number of these type of objects. Now, there's vocabulary that needs to be introduced. I'm going to introduce that vocabulary, and then we're going to run through the vocabulary uh, with a worked example of some sort. So, I'll begin with what we call the lower class limit. I like to abbreviate LCL, lower class limit, and it is the <clears throat> smallest value that can be in a class. <clears throat> There's no guarantee that your data actually contains a value that matches the lower class limit, but that is the smallest value that can be in any given class. Upper class limit, you see it. That's the largest value. These two, uh, these two vocabulary uh, objects are very, very easy to identify in most of the uh, tables we look at. 
Sometimes there's unique situations where an upper class limit or a lower class limit may not be particularly well defined. You'll see some of that in some of my other videos, but in general, they're very easy to find. We're gonna see that in just a moment. There is a unique relationship that goes on when one builds a frequency distribution. That relationship exists between the upper and lower class limits in something called the the class boundaries. These values separate classes without being a member of any class. It's a little confusing and of all the things we look at, uh, this is, eh, this ties with one other thing for the most confusing here. <clears throat> These are the values that actually serve to formally, if you will, define those classes. It's gotta be done in such a way that your data can't land on a boundary value or a border, if you will, between one class and another class. And you're gonna see that uh, in our example. The class midpoints are important components of every class, depending on the calculation that we make. The class midpoints, it is a value halfway between the upper and lower class limits. Those are the class midpoints. And we even have a uh, formula. I guess it'd be there. Midpoint equals lower class limit plus upper class limit all divided by two. Whoa, there's some real math we have to actually do. So you have your class midpoints. You have one other feature that appears in many of these frequency distributions and almost all of the classes. We have this notion of what we call the class width. This is a truly a tricky one for students because I can't give you a single rule that will work for all probability, or excuse me, frequency distributions. The class width is the distance between, and this is the important part, children, consecutive upper or lower class limits. And that's the class width. Not all classes actually have a class width. To have a class width, you need a well-defined upper and lower class limit. So you can use a fancy little formula. But in general, there is no requirement that all classes in a frequency distribution have a well-defined class width. <clears throat> You'll see some of those in my uh, some of my other videos. So those are the main features of any frequency distribution. Now, let me give ourselves an example to work with. All right, suppose we went out and we gathered up and I'll call it a simple random sample to keep in, uh, keeping with our uh, vocabulary up to this point. <clears throat> but we have worker ages in years and we have a frequency. So we went out and we counted up a bunch of people. We asked, well, how old are you? <clears throat> and we asked where they worked. And we came up with this age <clears throat> in years frequency distribution. So you can see we've got various classes over here on the left. So my classes are here. 
and the frequency count, as you can see, is on the right. Now, I want to talk about all of these things, and I want to give us a, a way to work with them. So, lower class limits. Where would those lower class limits be? These are the numbers here. These are my lower class limits. It's actually a little hard to see. Let me do that in green. So <clears throat> every class in this particular table has a lower class limit. They are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70. <clears throat> Upper class limits. These are the largest or greatest age that can be found in any class or category. There, we've got our upper class limits over there on the, oh, that doesn't show up all that well. That sucks, hold on. Upper class limits. So we've got upper class limits of 29, 39, 49, 59, 69, and 79. Now, the class boundaries are truly a little puzzling. They are the values that fall between the classes without being a part of any of the classes. There is a value that's halfway between the 30 and the 29. 39 and 40, 49 and 50, 59 and 60, 69 and 70. <clears throat> and usually the tables are more as straightforward as this. We can really sort of figure those class boundaries out <clears throat> merely by inspection. I'm going to leave a blank place here, though, for my initial class boundary. We're going to come back in and fill that in in a moment. So a number halfway between 29 and 30. 29.5, 39.5, 5, 49.5, 59.5, 69.5. And then there's one other one that I still have to capture here. Now, what's puzzling for most students when it comes to class boundaries is a lack of appreciation, I believe, for the importance of an initial class boundary. There's an initial boundary that begins that first class with a class limit of 20. 19.5 if I follow the pattern. <clears throat> there is a final class boundary that closes off <clears throat> the final class. That's the 79.5. So, Students will often get these ones in the middle once they figure it out, but it's easy to forget the first or the last class boundary. <clears throat> now, the class midpoints and the class width, I'm going to be doing those on a different sheet. <clears throat> because I need, for my midpoints, I need to do some simple Calculation. So for my first class, 20 plus 29 divided by 2, 30 plus 39 over 2, 40 plus 49 over 2, 50 plus 59 over 2, 60 plus 69 over 2, and 70 plus 79 over 2. These are very simple calculations to make. You add them together, you're going to get 24.5 when you divide by 2, 34.5, 44.5. And at some point, you'll pick up on the pattern. Ooh, ooh, 74.5. So there we go, class midpoints. Now. And the most complicated one is the class width. <clears throat> the width is confusing. I'm actually going to 
redraw the table because I need uh, I need to illustrate some things. So we've got 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, yep. and 70. So those are the classes right there. Now, let me take that away. Let me write width out here. <clears throat> now, to find the width of the first class, I have to take consecutive lower class boundaries. I cannot take consecutive upper class boundaries because I don't have one up there to do that. So for the lower class boundaries, I have 20 minus, excuse me, 30 minus 20 equals 10. And I'll do that all the way down. For the second class, 30 and 40. So we've got 40 minus 30. For the third class, you go up to the next one. 50 minus 40. Yes, they all look like they're 10, but I've got a point to make. 60 minus 50. Second to last class, 70 minus 60. It's the last class. It has an issue when we approach it from the standpoint. There's no next consecutive lower class limit. That's okay. You're going to use 79 minus 69. So we have a class width of 10 for all my classes here. Again, this can change depending on how your class is run. So the class width is truly one of the more difficult ones because of that little, oh, let me bring it back. Because of the way the definition reads, the way people read the definition and the subtlety with which the definition must be applied. All of these can cause issue. So you wanna keep that in mind when I ask you Things like what's the class width of the first or the last class? These are the things that will help you. Okay, so we've gone through, and we've gone through lower class limits, upper class limits, class boundaries, class midpoints, and class widths. Let's talk about a couple of different kinds of distributions that might be uh, built. First, if we have a frequency distribution, I can leverage that data in a couple of different ways. It helps provide insight that I might not otherwise have. First, the relative frequency distribution. This is the proportion of scores in any class. And we find that relative frequency, which I abbreviate RF, by taking the class count and dividing it by the total count. So <clears throat> relative frequency distribution means I've got to do a number of calculations. The first is to find N. And I'm gonna do this <clears throat> but I'm going to give you the second definition first, then I'm going to come back and run them both together. The cumulative frequency distribution is what I call a running total. And you'll see how that works also. So let me go ahead and run through this. I'm going to redraw my distribution. I probably should have had another copy ready to go, but that's okay. And then we have 4, 12, 
24, 26, 10, and 2. So those are the classes. Those are the frequencies. Bear with me. The first thing I need is my total N. So <clears throat> Mr. Calculator will help me. I will add up the four. And I won't bother demonstrating these basic uh, keystrokes. It's just four plus 12 plus 24 plus 26 plus 10 plus two. And I have a grand total of 78. So relative frequency, four over 78 equals, 12 over 78 equals, 24 over 78, 26, 10, and finally two, all divided by 78. And there's no real shortcut here. There's a little one, but a really basic uh, operation. So four divided by 78, and I usually take three decimal places. So 0 .0, 0 0.051, I'm gonna assume you know how to round your decimals to three places. We have 12 divided by 78, <clears throat> 0 0.154. We have 24 divided by 78, 0 0.308, 308. Ooh, 0 0.333, devil's half brother. Ten divided by seventy-eight, zero point one two eight, and finally two divided by seventy-eight, zero point zero two six. So that's the relative frequency distribution. Yes, you've got to do a little bit of a work, but the work honestly is quite quite uh, small. Simple division. The one thing you do need to remember to go do. You need to remember to go find Mr. Mr. N. We usually will use little n for samples. I'll lay out some of that vocabulary more tightly when we get into chapter three. <clears throat> now, I wanna run through the example with the cumulative frequency distribution because I always get the impression that this one is harder than it should be. So we've got our classes and we've got our counts. <clears throat> so let's see, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six distinct classes. You see me write them. I'm not going to write them again to save time, but I do want to count in here. That's a four, a 12, a 24, 26, a 10, and a two. Our cumulative frequency distribution is just that, cumulative. So we start with the four, because that's how much we have in the first class. The second one, I lump the first and the second class together. And then finally, four plus 12 plus, oh, I've got a cramp now. And if you've done things right, that last number you see there in the cumulative frequency distribution, <laughs> 78, that's also your N. So, Cumulative means to essentially accumulate, like a little squirrel accumulates nuts for the winter, perhaps. Anyway, it's fairly straightforward once you see it illustrated, but it can be a little bit weird working through it the first time through. 
So that runs me through the super basic stuff when it comes to frequency distribution. We have the definitions that we went through to describe our table. And then we have these other metrics uh, that I call them that we uh, work with the uh, relative frequency distribution, which often is presented in terms of a percentage by moving that decimal two places, and uh, the cumulative distribution. They all have something important to say about your data set. Now, and the last thing I wanna talk about this evening in terms of a lecture is I wanna talk about particular types of distributions or more accurately, a very particular type of distribution. <clears throat> the distribution is basically a description of how your values are laid out via the classes. <clears throat> so your normal distribution refers to your frequency counts. Our, uh, counts will start low <clears throat> and low is a relative term, compares to other numbers on the table. The counts start low, they increase to one to two high points or high counts, and then they decrease to low levels. And then it happens in an approximately the metric. I can't emphasize how much this notion of symmetry is really an approximation. So if I take a look at this frequency distribution, I can see that my counts start low and then they increase to a couple of one or two high points in the middle, in this case, the 24 and the 26. Then they decrease back down to another low point, and they do it in approximately a symmetric fashion. <clears throat> 2.2 references uh, what we call a histogram. I do not spend a lot of time with histograms. Uh, they tend to be a bit of a dead end for us, except for one thing. Our histograms enable us to visualize these normal distribution. So a histogram has <clears throat> classes on the, in fact, hold on, I wanna redo this page, goodbye. <clears throat> Histograms are also called bar charts. You have your class material, the class widths and limits and whatnot down there. You have your frequency distribution there. <clears throat> we use our class boundaries <clears throat> to essentially draw this type of graph. And I'm going to sort of just kind of, kind of fake it just because the picture is really what we need. So those are class boundaries. For example, uh, the class boundary here goes from 19.5 to 29.5 and they continue. I'm not gonna put them all in. And then you've got your scale out here on the left. <clears throat> the first class had four, then we had 12. 24, 26, 10, and two. So when you have a normal distribution and you visualize it via a histogram or a bar chart, if that's your pleasure, <clears throat> this looks like what we call a bell curve. So this is the big bell curve or bell-shaped distribution. And big boys and girls do not say bell shape. We say
we have a normal distribution. There are other fundamental shapes. We'll investigate one or two throughout the course of the semester. But in terms of what it is we do this semester, it is the bell curve, um, the normal distribution that gives the theory that we use the power that it has. And that's pretty much what I had prepared uh, for the group uh, regarding this type of, uh, this type of uh, data. So 2.1 breaks open the vocabulary, gives you a look at frequency distributions and their brothers and sisters, the relative and cumulative distributions. And it discusses this notion of a normal or bell-shaped distribution that will loom large uh, in, the, uh, in the weeks and months ahead. It's truly the basis of our uh, theory this semester. So that pretty much brings me to the end of my presentation. I will ask if there are any questions. I do see a question or something in the chat. <clears throat> ah, I have a hard time. I'll try to, uh, the, the question I see is, is can I uh, scan those questions? I'm gonna try to do that. I have a hard time doing that. Um, here's the deal. If your book arrives tomorrow, go ahead and do the homework and just email me the images you won't get a late charge, <laughs> like the library or something. That's just fine. We're very flexible. We know you're waiting for your books. Uh, and if you do get your book a little bit late and you email me directly with your homework, that's going to be just fine. It really will. I, I'm not hardcore, that guy. I see uh, that way. I see Alexandra has her hand up. You want to ask a question, Alexandra? Yes. Um, I went to the bookstore like two times already and then I asked for the book for your class but they said um you didn't require us the book but I said oh he put like we need the book. no no you book. guys need the book I'm not sure what happened with the bookstore uh they had the order uh I've reached out to them at least once I'll, I'll poke at them again um order it online just order it online it's much better uh, electronic versions are fine you can rent them whatever the case might be but, uh, but the bookstore is is a bit behind the times. I'm not sure what happened. It must be the virus. Delilah. Oh, okay, so I'm going to order it online because I, I wasn't able to get it. Yeah, yeah, order it online. And, and like I say, um, you can shoot me the homework when, when it shows up. I see. Okay. Uh, Thank um, you. Yeah, Delilah, you want to uh, ask a question? Yeah, we'll so I sent you an email. Um, yesterday and today i was wondering if you could respond to them as soon as you can i will i'll do that i i'll admit okay. i have not looked at my emails all day long okay, <laughs> but thank I, will. You. I will before the end of the evening i'll you'll have a response <clears throat> let me uh let me turn off my camera and switch back to uh me Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so yes, um, I'll, I'll get to, to those emails a little bit later tonight. Ashley, you have a question also? Um, yeah, so I pre-ordered my book. Um, so I don't know exactly when I'm going to be getting it. So the assignments, are they going to be like, am I not going to get reductions on them? No, you will not get a reduction on them. <clears throat> um, and, and honestly, it, it's, it's, it, I do this the entire semester, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult enough getting everything to happen timely online. Um, and you really need to try to get it done in a timely fashion. Otherwise, you'll just be getting behind by the time we get to our quizzes. But honestly, you know, if, if you if you do run over and it's like you can't submit it, reach out to me directly. And in almost all cases, I'll go ahead and take it. I really, it's not going to be an issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if it, honestly, if it was a face-to-face -face class, it'd be so easy to rake people over the coals for this kind of stuff, but it's a different world, honestly. <clears throat> questions, other questions? I don't see any there. <clears throat> all right, you know, if there are no other questions, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to let you all go and I need to, uh, <clears throat> oh, 
I need to stop my recording.